Thanks. Um, so my, my role will be actually relatively brief. Um, so we're talking about this project called Clever, um, actually Silverse, which is, which is in a larger project called Clever. Um, and my goal is to sort of tell you how we in the lab got to that point in time. Um, and then Meredith will take it forward from there. Um, so that, I'm going to tell you about the VR and AR journey that we've been on. Um, and then Meredith will talk about authenticity, interactivity, and collaboration. Um, at least in my part, um, if there's an urgent question, feel free to sort of interrupt me if I haven't been clear about something. Um, and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. OK, so um, we were both from the Education Arcade, um, which is also uh, with part of the Scheller Teacher Education Program. Um, we sort of do a few big things within the lab. Um, we design and create new experiences, like the one we'll be talking about today. Um, part of that is to sort of think about the ways that new technologies help us address things that we weren't able to do with existing technologies. Um, I think it's a, a, a particular perspective that we take in the lab, which is not just sort of like increasing in efficiency or, um, or making things more exciting necessarily. It's really about sort of addressing sort of fundamental things we weren't able to address before in previous, with previous technologies. Part of that we also implement and scale experiences. So some projects like this one is fairly early on, but already getting out into some schools, um, as Meredith was uh, in some schools today. Um, but part of what we do is really work on real problems that we want to get out into schools um, and have make a difference. Uh, and finally, we develop capacity for new experiences. So we work with other entities to help them develop similar capacities. Uh, so later this week, I'm going um, to another country where we're sort of helping them develop new schools that involve um, STEAM approaches, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and they integrate technology engineering um, along with um, the humanities in interesting new ways enabled by technologies. OK, um, so we've been doing some AR and VR stuff for quite a while. We have a longer experiences in AR in our lab. Um, and sometimes I sort of like to lay out the way I think about um, these things. Um, so this is actually someone else's perspective. Virtual reality can take you anywhere. Augmented reality can bring anything to you. That's one perspective on what the difference is. Um, I think about virtual reality help you, helping you experience new worlds. Augmented reality helps you experience this world in new ways. Now, there are certainly ways that you can sort of do, flip those around. Um, I, I think I should sort of preface my statement with, at its best, um, this is what they do. So it's trying to think about what are the, what are the affordances of these things. Um, so speaking of affordances, um, there's, um, there's sort of this, this is a, an existing sort of spectrum that exists here along the x-axis here, um, from reality on one side to virtual reality on the other side. I think this was Milgram who, who did this one. Um, and the idea is that you um, have things that are sort of non-digital completely, um, all the way on the left-hand side here, completely digital all the way on the right-hand side there. And rather than sort of thinking about some arbitrary binary space uh, between um, reality and virtual reality, we think about this sort of wide space where you can be at any place in between there. It's, there's lots of gray areas. Um, I've added to this sort of a y-axis here, um, which is about spatial scale. Um, so spatial scale from tabletop, where we sort of do things at a very small scale where you might be sitting down, um, all the way up to landscape scale, um, which is sort of where you might be walking around um, in some large space. Uh, and, um, and the questions are sort of what are the sort of advantages of working in these different areas here, from you know, augmented reality at room scale to virtual reality at landscape scale? What are the sort of advantages that we think about those different um, spatial perspectives? Um, so um, I do want to be careful. The word affordances sometimes has a lot of baggage with it. Um, we don't sort of look at this as technological determination here in terms of what it's doing. We look at the affordances as possibility spaces. So the technology sort of enables us to sort of do interesting things. It doesn't sort of dictate what we do. Um, so it, advances in mobile technologies allow us to do interesting things like Pokemon Go, where you're walking around in big landscapes and sort of experiencing these sort of virtual entities that exist in real spaces. Um, but they also allow us to sort of take quizzes on phones. Um, so because, just because the mobile technologies allow us to do interesting and things that are sort of outside of the spaces of existing technologies doesn't necessarily mean that we will do those things. And isn't to say that tech, uh, quizzes on phones are bad. It's just not using anything that's an affordance, particularly of that mobile technology. Um, so um, in this space of mixed reality, we've spent a fair bit of time up here. Um, and I'll just talk about that for like one second here. So that's a sort of landscape scale, lightly augmented reality is what I call it. So it's not unlike Pokemon Go. I now have a reference point. We've been doing this work for about uh, 15 or more years now. And so I didn't have the Pokemon Go reference for many years to sort of say, it's like Pokemon Go. Now I do have that reference. Um, so it is something like that. The idea is you're working on large spatial scales. Um, and you're working on things where you spend a lot of time actually looking at the world around you. You're not going to spend a lot of time looking at your phone, per se, in that space. Um, in our case, we've been specifically interested in things that connect deeply with the 
landscape that you're in. So it's not just about sort of being in a space because um, in some ways, Pokemon Go, the markers have some historical significance. You can, the, which Pokemon you find have somewhat to do with the geography or the, um, the, the landscape that you're in, but it's a pretty loose connection where our idea is to pretty tightly connect um, what you're doing in that space to the space that you're in. So we have a platform here. Oh, sorry, before we get to the platform, um, my colleague Kurt Squire and I, this is again probably 15, 16 years ago, thought about mobile devices as they were just sort of emerging before even smartphones were existing. We were, we were using PDAs, personal digital assistants, like the Palm Pilot at the time. Uh, and looking at things like portability, you could take the computer with you anywhere. That is something that a lot of people do use. Social interactivity, which at the time was relatively novel. Obviously, now that's one of the major things that people do on phones. Context sensitivity, so it knows where it is. Um, so and a lot of times that's spatial location, but it can be about who's near you at the time. That uh, it matters as well. Um, connectivity, uh, again, this was sort of early on in the days of that time, but the idea that you're connected to other devices and potentially to the entire internet at the same time. And finally, individuality. So there's, some sort of, there's something about this device being personal and has meaning to me, and so there's some representation of me on this device. Um, and so the platform we have now, we've gone through many iterations of this. It's called Tailblazer. Um, it's for making these sort of mobile location-based games. Um, and the idea here is that we're trying to sort of connect um, science issues in communities to those communities themselves. So people make uh, games about um, environmental issues, health issues, economic issues that are existing within communities, and you, then you play those in the actual communities that you're talking about. And um, we also work with kind of zoos and gardens, with places of interest, so they're making games specifically about the things that are in that space, but revealing an extra layer. So when we work with a zoo, we think about what are the messages that you're interested in delivering to your audience and having them experience that they don't see. So if you see a lion or see a polar bear, you may not be sort of understanding the messages that they're deeply interested in about wildlife conservation, about climate change, and the game connects the things that you're physically seeing to some of these meanings that they're trying to integrate into their, into their um, messages. Um, so now getting to the work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so we're now down here in this quadrant. Um, so this is sort of tabletop to maybe a little bit of small scale room stuff in this sort of heavily virtual space. So we're not, we don't have really any um, real space sort of taking a, a big advantage of, uh, of this platform here. And when we think about this, um, this was actually a quote. This was uh, several years ago now. There was a school that was really interested in virtual, tech, virtual reality. And they were like, we're going to base our school on virtual reality. Um, and the idea is that they're going to do serious things with this. Instead of playing video games, students will enter a fully immersive and scientifically accurate virtual reality chemistry lab um, where they can look at things like, does adding salt affect the boiling point of water? Um, so um, as I have a, that's, that's actual reality on the bottom there, um, where you actually can boil uh, salt water. It's relatively inexpensive. You can do this on the order of dollars <laughs> um, and make this accessible to lots of people. And it works just fine in the real world. So this, is not, this perspective is not really taking advantage of the, I think, what's unique and interesting about, um, about virtual reality. Um, so instead, we look at it as, instead of playing video games, that's actually what you should be doing. Um, so experiencing things that you would not be able to do in the real world is where we think about virtual reality. So here's something about you know, swimming underwater with sharks or dinosaurs. And, you know, those are the things we can't experience in the real world. And those are the things we want to be able to bring through virtual reality. Uh, so in the same way we think of uh, affordances of some of the, the mobile technologies, these are the things we've thought, thought about in virtual reality. Um, so immersion, this is one that gets talked a about a lot. It's the idea that a participant actually feels like they're there. Um, this is um, maybe a physiological condition as well as a psychological condition, um, that you actually feel like you're in the place that you're simulating. Um, perspective, um, so you can have lots of different perspectives. So sometimes we think about this simply as my first person perspective on this space. But I can take lots of different perspectives on this, both in terms of um, different views on a system, as well as different parts of that system. So if I'm a person, I might sort of uh, move around from person to person. But I can also look at different spatial scales that I'm on at the same time. Interaction, um, because we can't necessarily see our controllers in our hands, um, a lot of times we've sort of relied on sort of much more natural interactions where we're moving our hands around and we have controllers that simulate our hands in those spaces. Um, we're getting to the point where we're actually our hands will be the controllers in these spaces. So the kinds of interactions that we have are, are a lot more natural in many ways than the kinds of things we do with keyboards or game controllers. Sensation, this is again getting back to that sort of physiological connection. Um, if any of you have been in some of these uh, virtual reality simulators where you walk to the edge of a building and look down, um, you can't help but sort of get a feeling in your stomach that, you, uh, that you're really high up if it's done well. Um, so there's this sort of physiological connection within it, which can also, be, can also be problematic. We sometimes need to work around this because people can get sick in these spaces. 
Um, and finally, spatial representation. So these 3D representations that are sometimes, even on a flat screen when we're looking at things in quote 3D, sometimes are hard to understand. We can now get different representations of those on a, in a 3D space that allows us to understand things that we couldn't necessarily before. Um, so I, we've sort of outlined, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details on these, a number of sort of then sort of properties that allow us to sort of um, build upon these underlying affordances. Um, so one is the idea that we can use this as a collaborative uh, platform. Um, so this is um, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Has anybody played this game? A, few, a couple people. Um, the idea in this game is that there's one person in virtual reality. This is, if you've ever seen like a, a movie, like a police movie, you've seen something like this. There's one person in virtual reality, and they need to defuse a bomb. Um, there's the people who have the instruction manuals for the bomb, and they're not in virtual reality. So they need to be able to converse with the person who's in virtual reality to help them defuse the bomb. Um, and so the idea here is that you have a pretty tight collaboration. The person inside of virtual reality can't do anything without the people outside of virtual reality and vice versa. So we build on that principle, as you'll see um, in Clever. Uh, and the second thing is scale. Um, as we think these are sort of things that in, the, in, the, uh, in flat media or in the, in the real world, the Rose Planetarium, and I can't remember the name of the video, um, Powers, of, Powers, Powers of 10. Powers of 10. Um, which are sort of trying to get the idea across uh, about different sp spatial scales. And a lot of scientific phenomenon happen at different spatial scales. And we typically have single representations of those at one spatial scale. And the connection between them can often be confusing. So the idea is that we can sort of experience this 3D and have different perception within virtual reality. And the question is, can we use that to help people understand things that happen at multiple scales? So with that, I think I will, my remote will die. There we go. And I'll hand it over to Meredith to talk about the specific project. Thanks, Eric. Great. So the first thing I think it would be interesting to do is actually to see what it is that we're talking about. So we have a very short, very short video. And it will go. All right. gives you kind of a big picture view of, um, of the game. And we'll go back and, and, and kind of explore a, different pieces and parts of the game that you saw kind of all together. Um, the first part, and, and, and as I mentioned before, we are going to be looking at three different aspects of um, building in virtual reality. The first part is authenticity. And authenticity plays a big part in Cellverse. Um, one of the things that we often say when we are going out and talking about Cellverse is that cells are complicated, right? They're very complicated, they're dynamic, and yet we teach them, we teach students very simplistic models, almost schematics of cells. And so students think about cells as very simplistically. Uh, they, they, that's just what they draw when you ask them. Um, and in fact, we actually call this uh, the Whitman sampler view of the cell. <laughs> Uh, because everything is neatly laid out, nothing touches, um, there's, it's all labeled. And um, in fact, cells are really complicated. And one of, the, one of the many ideas that students have about cells are that they're all round. And so you may have noticed in the film, but I'll have a couple of still shots so we can kind of look at it again, is that the cell in Cellverse is not round. In fact, it's a type of cell called an ionocyte, which was just discovered 
probably about halfway through our project, which is my first top to, um, kind of point about authenticity, is that authenticity is challenging because as science advances, uh, your game has to um, evolve and change. And that is one thing we had to do. We had to basically um, recreate some of the environment in order to really represent um, uh, this, um, the cell in a way that we wanted to in an authentic way. I'll step back one step. Um, the premise of the game is that you are a, um, an intern, a high school intern in a, a hospital, and you're basically uh, charged with figuring out what type of cystic fibrosis a patient has. And different types of cystic fibrosis have different clues within the cell. So you have to explore the cell through first a microbot and then a nanobot. And that's how you figure out what type of cystic fibrosis um, this person has. And so um, this, that's why we decided that we would do, uh, we almost had to do an, a, a different design for the cell because these ionocytes are definitely uh, not round and they're somewhat different in some ways than other cells. Um, so one of the things you might have noticed is that um, the, the cell in the game is not round. You start out kind of in one of the arms of the cell, um, which is great, one of the kind of protrusions, because you can start out in a simpler environment, and you're able to kind of introduce the students to, um, to more complexity as you're going along. And we have um, FR3ND, who's kind of a guide uh, at a, through the cell. Not exactly authentic for that, but an important, <laughs> important to help um, scaffold the experience. So just a few stills, here I'll go back. You're, you kind of go through from the protrusion into the actual cell proper, into the larger part of the cell, it's all part of the cell, and you see different organelles. And um, there are ways that we can actually represent even more authenticity by having lots and lots of proteins and, and, and ribosomes basically spinning around. But we also allow that to be toggled off because it can be overwhelming visually overwhelming. So, um, and when you're thinking about authenticity, there's also this idea that even something that you want to be very authentic, you also have to consider the users when you're designing it. So, another thing that um, Eric mentioned in terms of affordances of VR is this idea of being able to understand size and scale a little bit, um, in a little bit more de in depth. So, we just saw some screenshots of the cellular level, kind of the micro level view. And you spend some time in the game in the micro level view. And then FR3ND prompts you, would you like to go to the nano level view? And so the nano level view um, allows students to see um, ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum that are translating RNA into um, amino acid chains in a very, uh, very kind of visual and dynamic way. And so students are able to, when we, when we interview students after they do the game, they're, they're able to really understand that that was a size down. When a person, we were just in Somerville High School today, and a person even drew on her cell drawing um, one size down and then drew RNA and drew um, uh, amino acids in her cell drawing. So students are getting the sense of that you can't see RNA if you're at the micro scale. You have to go to a different scale. So it's important to understand what they learn. And we measure what they learn in a few different ways. We have a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. We have students draw cells before and after. And we also interview them um, to, to, get, to get their feedback, because students will generally talk a little bit more than they will write. So um, one of the things, so uh, we have two sites that we went to this fall, and one of them was Greater Lawrence Technical School, which is up in Lawrence, and it's a vocational school. So the students are, are self-described as hands-on learners, and they really benefited from this uh, a hands-on, kind of virtually hands-on representation of what is otherwise kind of an abstract concept of the cell, which hits another one of uh, Eric's points earlier, which is going someplace that you can't go otherwise, you know, shrinking down to a cellular level or to an RNA level is something that you just can't do um, if you're not in virtual reality. So one thing that we notice is that the number of organelles um, increases, um, that there are, there's more texture, um, more complexity to their drawings, and that this also the sizes and the shapes of these um, the cell drawings 
changed. They have um, a, a wider view of what a cell looks like. Uh, when we compare the pre and the post, one of the things we see is that some of the representations go up uh, and, and some of them actually go down in the post. Fewer people represent the nucleus, fewer people represent cell membrane. Um, but when you look at these, these are the these are the organelles that are really highlighted in the game. And you can see that um, a lot more students are recognizing and representing those in their drawings. Another aspect of VR that we are tapping into is this idea of interactivity. And as I mentioned, we are currently in the data collection process. So I have some kind of, I have some quotes that I have from student interviews that I've drawn out. Um, we don't have the full tabulations of those yet. I'm going to. Um, show you kind of what students gave feedback on in the game. The first thing is in uh, some of our pilot studies, we noticed that st students' conversations when they're doing the collaborative part of the game show a strong sense of spatial presence. They really feel like they are in the game. They feel like they're there. And that's really important. When you think about interactivity, there's like this idea of immersion within an environment and then interactivity with the environment. And Feeling like you're immersed in the environment is a key part of a virtual reality experience. And we're finding that students in the collaborative game, they're talking about spatial presence. And um, the, the navigator and the explorer, two, two different roles that I'll explain in a few minutes, um, are talking about, they both talk about um, sp uh, spatial presence a lot. Um, when students describe their experience, the, um, one thing that students say is that this is hands on which is interesting because it's virtual. But I'll, um, I usually like to listen to a teacher read about it, but we actually get a hands-on experience of what we're supposed to learn about. And this idea of, again, making conceptual ideas concrete virtually um, is, is powerful to students. Um, the students in Lawrence especially mentioned this a, a few times. Um, this idea of navigating, of moving through a world is also important. And students mentioned, when this particular student talked about, it looked like I was traveling down a tube of some kind to the nucleus. And I, I didn't think a cell would be like, that, be like that. Thought of cells as more simplistic and um, would only be like the traditional Whitman sampler view that we mentioned in the beginning. Um, environment is actually is also important. Um, and then the one, of, one student in particular talked about the uh, game letting them go in the depth of the cell and then every to every piece so they know the layers and the part and what it's called. And so it, this actually leaves an, an impression of the cell in their head. Um, students are able to refer to a clipboard during the game so they don't have to remember everything. They can have access to kind of a, um, um, a reference. And that's one thing that kind of reinforces different um, roles of different organelles within the game. And finally, uh, I think I have, yeah, I think this might be it. Finally, um, VR, gave, VR gave students a different perspective on um, on these topics. Um, VR gave a better look at it from up close rather than looking at it, the cell, from a diagram. There are a lot more parts than I thought there would be from other ways that I've learned it. So when you think about this, there are kind of two themes that are coming up. This idea of the interaction with the environment, being able to move through the environment, being able to have kind of a hands-on experience, and then this idea of immersion in an environment where having that perspective and feeling like you are there are important. And one of the things that we did, this is part of our sample, is we asked students at the end, you know, did you feel like you were there, and if so, why? And students um, kind of evenly talked about the immersion in the environment and the interaction with the environment. A few students talked about feeling disoriented or lost, and a lot of students didn't specify. They weren't able to explain exactly why they felt like they were there, but they, they did mention that they felt like they were present in the world. The second part, uh, the third part, is collaboration. And um, that's something that we've integrated into the game. Um, we actually have MIT students are our primary programmers and designers. And we have a team of MIT students who collaborate throughout the summer. Um, this is our team this past summer. And um, they do accomplish an incredible amount. We've had three summers of work on this, and we've gotten a long way. Um, we've had to redesign for authenticity's purpose. And so, um, so we are still, we have lots of things that we'd like to do. But we've made some um, pretty significant progress on creating a really authentic and immersive cellular environment. 
Um, collaboration is also logistically helpful in classrooms. Um, imagine having 20 students, each of whom are in virtual reality headsets, moving around the classroom. That is scary in some ways when you really think about it. And um, so this idea of partnering up and having a teacher be able to um, oversee partners rather than 20 students in did you have for each explorer? For each explorer. So we had an explorer and a navigator. Um, and then so we did this past this past fall, we were doing a little bit more of a single player version. But in the we've had 20 different pairs that we've looked at in depth. So um, so 20, 20 navigators and one 20 explorers. Yeah, a one to one. That's your question. Yes. Yes. Um, so yes, here's an example of, here's what it looks like. You have somebody who's in a headset and then somebody who's on a tablet. And the person on the tablet um, has a different view of the cell. In fact, I have that. Um, done in pairs. You have two different views. Um, the navigator view has um, you know, a, a, a bigger picture. Uh, they're able, they have certain tools, like there's a, a microscope tool where they're actually able to highlight different um, organelles in the cell using a technique that's relatively new called slamming. Um, and it basically uses wavelengths of light to light up different parts of the cell. So the cell can be looked at in, in vivo rather than having to kill it and stain it. Um, and so we've kind of built that into the game. Uh, there's also a little RX down here. And the students at the end, one part of their assessment is actually to figure out what type of cystic fibrosis they think it is. So they have to connect the clues to an actual actionable um, diagnosis. So here's an example where you can light up different organelles. And then it gives you some information here just in time so students can refer to it. Um, a bigger picture view, including some um, different types of cystic fibrosis and the clues. And you have to look for these clues within the cell. And then again, at the end, having to select a therapy is part of figuring out what students learn from the game. Um, so we've looked at collaboration in a couple of different ways. And um, one way is this idea of group flow. How do, how do groups work together? And here groups, again, are <coughs> pairs, work together in collaborative problem solving process. And so we've done some looking at, at this with um, with pairs of students who we videotape, and we've also done this with teachers, and we uh, transcribe and we really examine their uh, conversations and what's going on. And one thing that we do see is that they do go through these different stages of the collaborative problem solving process, where first they have to establish a shared ver uh, vision of what the problem is. They have to figure out who owns what types of, uh, what aspects of the collaborative problem solving process, how to communicate, and then that idea, selecting the therapy, this idea of collective emergence um, on one particular therapy for the cell. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're doing um, looking at conversation and using a technique called epistemic network analysis that basically looks at um, looks at conversation kind of in groups and sees how ideas are connecting with each other by seeing how often those ideas come up. Um, and how close they are um, in the conversation. So um, if Dan and I were to talk about um, orienting, I'm orienting um, myself in the cell, and Dan is giving me um, ideas about where I am rel relative to the nucleus or relative to the centrosome, then that would be coded as um, orienting. And we would see how often that would come up and what points in the conversation that would come up. So we're actually able to, as you can see, there are a bunch of different points um, that you can actually look over time and actually map how often different ideas are coming up in conversation. We're in. Um, early stages of this, one of the things we notice is um, that here, um, the, the connection between, for example, one-way communication and two-way communication is basically you have somebody who's, you have the explorer who might be talking about their own experience in the cell. And the navigator is saying, wait a minute, we have to figure out how it is that we're going to work together. We have to, um, you have to be able to communicate with me about what we're doing. Um, the other thing that we've seen is this idea of collaborative clue finding, where two-way um, communication and clue finding are strongly linked. And those tend to be, um, those tend to be pairs that really get far, far along within the game, are really able to um, establish a discussion and keep that going through the game. 
we're in the early stages of this, as you can see, because I'm still, I still have overlapping things. So I will uh, fix those. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and discussion. So um, what I wanted to kind of summarize what we've done so far. We had um, first a user study in 2017 where we really, we really found that um, expert and novice input helped us design this project. Um, we did a qualitative study in 2018 uh, where we learned that there's a high spatial presence to the game and this idea of collaboration changes over time. Um, there's a, we did the quantitative study where basically just finished it today. We went to our last day, waking up super early and getting all the equipment to the school and facilitating this experience. And um, it was two urban high needs schools, Somerville and Lawrence. And um, we are currently getting ready to analyze those data and learn from that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention today is that I have some promotional copies of a book called In Virtual, Envisioning Virtual Reality. A lot of people, when they hear about virtual reality, say, gee, how can we possibly do this in the classroom? And we have partnered up with a teacher in Barberton, Ohio, named David Kayser, who has a really neat model of um, basically having his students, his 11th and 12th grade students, um, be facilitators. They learn about VR apps that are out there. They rate them. They share them with teachers. And then if teachers want to use them, they go out to the classroom and um, facilitate the technology so the teacher can just really focus on teaching. Um, it's very well described within the book that we have put together, which I have some promotional copies of today. So, um, and that's it. Are there questions? Go ahead. Yeah. So this is great. <clears throat> one, one observation is, and maybe I'd like to kind of get your opinion on, sure. is that in this kind of day and age where you have uh, people really kind of somehow rejecting science, the content here is fantastic. And, and, and the way you're depicting, it's like a better version of that diagram of flat cell. Now it's a 3D cell with all this. But yeah, have you considered um, having kind of an open source movement kind of to really uh, objectify how reality happens within like a cell models that are really open source for everybody to see and believe in them because I think the risk I see um, is that you know there's an increasingly uh, 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 an increasing number of people that believe that the earth is flat and that's kind of right. really ridiculous right but you can see how that could easily translate to something saying that's not how reality works this is all conspiracy how, so what are the mitigating forces that you're thinking about in creating the content for this type of education okay so <laughs> this is discussions that we have all the time. So, uh, and, and Dan, I should introduce Dan Roy is the designer for the game, and he is here uh, supporting in the audience. So, um, basically, what you're saying is uh, this representation of the game, how do we have, make sure that that representation isn't mistook for? Yeah, so people saying, yeah, you know, that, I agree that that's a cell, and that's the house. But that's the only cell. Like that's it, right? Well, that, that's a consensus on it, right? Because if people, people can easily object to that without understanding how the mechanics work, how, how, how you got to that endpoint. And I'm saying that that's a risk for you guys. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think... Um, so the structure of the cell is less controversial than like whether the world is flat for whatever reason <laughs> or, whether, or whether the climate is warming due to, to man's influence or... Um, yeah, or lots of other sort of scientifically relevant issues. So I think there's less of a less of a uh, sort of a, a, a cultural movement to sort of like try to come up with some sort of alternative explanation for what a cell is in this case. Um, uh, but let me. Uh, what I will say is that so I think I think there's an incredible amount of effort that goes into just making this cell. I um, mean, this is sort of just scratching the surface of what one might do, even in the in the context of you know. It, a biology class at the high school or early college level. Um, so I think thinking about the ways we think about an open source movement where there's a collaboration going on around this is something that would be really important to sort of make something effort like this scalable and to have a larger impact. Um, that said, I think specifically in the space of virtual reality, we're pretty early on in that. And so like I know that like the technology, you know, as we think about um, uh, you know, in the space of uh, educational games where we've done a lot more work, um, we're sort of in a space where we can do a little bit more of that. The platforms are sort of more uniform. The ways that we sort of think about building those things are more uniform. People can have different components that they can exchange. Virtual reality is still the sort of somewhat of the wild, wild west. So it's hard to think about sort of coming up with enough standards where people could work together on those sorts of things. 
that said, sort of the, the, the notion of sort of using virtual reality to sort of address some of the issues that I think you're talking about is an interesting one um, in that because people do feel like um, because it feels more real that it is more real as a result of that. But that's a double-edged sword in some ways. I think if you have responsible people using a medium like that, then they can sort of be conveying messages that they think are sort of um, consensus, best, well-informed efforts. But those, those same media could be used by people to show it's clear that the Earth is flat, or it's clear that, um, you know, that here's, a, here's a graph of the climate you know, remaining the same over the years. And because you saw it in virtual reality, it's more meaningful. So I think there's, um, there's sort of a, uh, a media literacy that we need to be teaching in this, in this day and age, specifically when you can think of media that seem extremely compelling that we need to be able to teach people how to interrogate those media and be able to ascertain the truth from that. Um, and so the final piece is that with, with these experiences and the way we think about all this, it's facilitated. So there's a teacher within that space. And I think that an equal important part of our effort, we told you that we told you about the technology here, but to train the teachers to be able to sort of engage, engage the students in the right ways with those, with those media is also important. And that's where that issue of sort of um, media transparency and um, and truth in media also comes out in the in the training of those teachers. Go ahead, Jeff. So in games like Civilization, when you explore, you sort of shine light on a, a landscape that's dark. And I'm wondering, kind of analogously, you talk about the clipboard in this. Does the clipboard have all the information such that if you go to it, you're going to encounter things you haven't yet encountered in the game? Or do you unveil information in the clipboard only as you've discovered it in the game? Um, so you are able to basically, um, so there, the, you're, it's a just-in-time kind of information about the organelle. And right now, there are two things that the clipboard does. The first thing is it tells you uh, basically what you're looking at. And the second thing it does is it actually allows you to sample that. So on the bottom, there's a little button that you can sample. And so the sampling piece is part of putting together your case, your evidence for which type of cystic fibrosis that you have. And so the, in, in, in some ways, to answer your question, you are able, to, it's, it's, you're sort of uncovering what is in the world that you're seeing and trying to understand and interpret it. And the second part is you're also making those connections between that organelle and is this a clue for this type of cystic fibrosis. So you need to see it in order to get its clipboard right. reading, right? Yeah. Right. You need to see it. But there's no reveal beyond um, when you're in the cellular environment. Well, actually, there is a reveal. The slamming technique that I mentioned, initially, when you get in the cellular environment, everything is grayscale because things aren't actually colored in a cell. And it's the navigator who is able to light up and kind of reveal the different organelles um, in the collaborative game. So, other questions? Go ahead. Just thinking very long term, sure. um, I'm curious to ask your inputs about the efficacy of scaffolding uh -huh. to be able to more concretely demonstrate the scientific method uh, in action. Yep. So I think it was just last week there was this uh, uh, really uh, record-breaking uh, news report about uh, cystic fibrosis treatment and mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. people's lifetimes can be drastically improved now. Right. So there's, there's a long, I think, 30-year history there that is a testimony about drug experimentation and engineering and reverse engineering, you figure it yeah. out. And I'm wondering, am I thinking too much like a teacher that I can lecture that, that uh, iterative closing in on how to treat this illness? Yeah. Or could it be scaffolded? Could you have like um, releases of this game, right? So sort of like, like a trilogy of Star Wars movies, right? You have, you have sort of version one and then the Empire Strikes Back and then <laughs> you find a way to finally corral and, and defeat it a little. I mean, it's a fantastic, um, it's fantastic I, thought, and I almost see it in two different ways. There's this idea of what's going on about cystic fibrosis and how do you develop um, treatments and what is that process, kind of the clinical trials, the, um, understanding uh, basically 
seeing how different types of um, medication and drugs might help with cystic fibrosis. So there's that whole piece. And then there's also the what's going on inside the body. And one of the things we'd love to do is actually scale up even more so you could see what's happening at the, um, the organ level and seeing what's happening at the actual full body level. Uh, we haven't gotten to that yet. But I think both of those, this idea of what is the context, how does that context about the specificity of cystic fibrosis scale to having students understand this whole process? Um, uh, how, do we, how do we come up with, uh, with um, therapies for different types of diseases? But I think, I, think there, I read another layer into your question, which was could you sort of like, like make these as a historical moment in time? So right now we sort of model this based on really authentic current, like really they work really hard, like current, like last month current. <laughs> yeah. Um, understanding the way the cell works and the way the disease works. Um, one could imagine sort of making that model based on the model of five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and thinking about how you would experience it then um, and, and what you might do in those points in time and why that would lead to particular therapies then that we don't see now, that we're, that we're not, which are different than the ones we're working on now, um, which is an interesting perspective. That's, I don't think that's something that we've thought about, but I think that's an interesting idea. Is, that, is there enough of a playful hook here to make a student mm -hmm. want to play those three different games? Mm -hmm. yeah. or would they just play one and go, I got the idea? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, a, a big thing that, that, that we think about is how do we make the connection to what the teachers are interested in teaching then? So the question is, what are they interested in teaching by sort of having the three different, like, you know, it's the, it's the 1991, the, the 2001, and the 2019 one. Um, you know, what are, they, what are they trying to teach with those different ones? So maybe it, it could be about, you know, I think it's an interesting journey, but the question is, you know, is it about particular cellular functions that you might focus on in those three different uh, eras? Um, and, or maybe it's about, um, you know, maybe it's more, maybe you could make it more about the scientific method, but again, I think teachers like to try that, to tie that to specific content. So it's a question of how you make that journey parallel to particular learning goals, which I think would be an interesting challenge. This is actually an issue that comes up, not just in this, but in uh, online material in general. It depends on the field. So if you chose biology, which is a very fast-moving field, had you cho chosen linear algebra, you know, probably would not be more physics. <laughs> it's moving really pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's something that we've discussed with MOOCs as well, that, that biology, particularly, is a very fast-moving field. And it, and so it is, uh, you have many people who are dealing with this issue. Yeah. It, it does make it particularly, I mean, so it, it makes it challenging because we sort of need to stay up to date. But it also makes it, um, there's, a, there's a lot of demand for the application because they sort of, particularly as, as uh, Meredith talked about, one of the places we're working at is Greater Lawrence Technical, and we've worked at the place in um, Gloucester, which is I'm oh, the Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. So, th so there's a lot of people who are sort of trying to think about. I want to be able to train technicians who have an, enough of an understanding of these sort of current techniques, which means understand enough of the biology, and sometimes without sort of a really long academic history in that space. So, um, so there's a lot of demand for it at the same time as there is. I think you're right that there's big challenges too. And there's this idea of developing an expert's, uh, an, an, an expert's view of even scale, understanding um, what happens at the cellular level, what happens at the nano level. And uh, research on size and scale basically says that um, a, you know, an astronomer might understand astronomic scale very, very well, but not actually be able to think in nano scale all that well. It's you really develop this idea of um, what goes on within the scale of your focus or your expertise. And this could potentially be a way of having students exercise those ideas and think a little bit more deeply about size and scale in the cellular level. to um, sort of follow up on some of the things that Enrique and Eric were talking about, about um, using these uh, simulations, these, uh, this, these experiences that you could illustrate that the world was flat. You could sort of, you know, you could do something that was not actually true. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, in this case, where you're looking at a cell and you're traveling through a cell, um, have you thought to tie in with that experience some of the photography that we get from micro cameras and nano cameras that sometimes can be hard to really understand when we're just looking at a lot of fuzzy, you know, moving stuff. But if, but if you're educated on sort of the structural um, components that can be really clarified mm -hmm. in a virtual experience where you can really sort of show the tubes and experience the tubes, can you then lead students into actually real photography and real um, videos and sort of show them 
help them understand them better? Does, is that something you've, you've thought about or do you think it's useful? I think that would be that would be incredible. We have some of that in the navigator view. So um, the person on the tablet actually um, some of the uh, information about the different types of cystic fibrosis actually has um, actual real images, photographs. real photographs of um, a protein that's misfolded and a protein that's um, correctly folded, a protein that's too uh, that's the right size and the proteins that are fragmented, and so they're not the right size. Um, amino acid chains that are fragmented and are not the right size. And so we do, when possible, integrate those in. What we haven't done is integrate them into the explorer view while you're actually in VR, and to be able to have those come up then. So that, that would be, I think, a really interesting idea. Um, I don't know, Dan, do, we have, do you have anything that you wanted to add in terms of the design? Sure, so we've looked at a lot of microscopy for this project. Um, one of the challenges is that the microscopy techniques don't work at all scales. So when you're when you're talking about nanoscale, you're really not talking about photography. Um, you know, optics don't work at that scale the same way that uh, the human eye would. So you're talking about gathering bits of information from electrons or from uh, other techniques that you can then piece together and. Uh, I went back and forth on trying to be as authentic as possible with our microscopy techniques and our renderings and felt like, well, I don't want it to just be a simulation and look like a, a virtual representation. I want it to look real. And, and the more I dug in on what that means, the more I started to feel like there's no there there. Like, <laughs> actually, it is all simulation or, or it's some amalgamation of data from different sources. And so that actually made me feel more comfortable when we took the slamming technique and decided actually we're just going to turn organelles on and off because uh, we're going to say that it's all a simulation or it, it's a representation of information that is being uh, garnered from the cell environment. But that's actually how scientists work as well. Even when they're doing stains or uh, tagging or other techniques that scientists use in the lab, uh, they generally are not looking at everything in the cell at the same time. The whole point of a stain is to focus on three different categories of organelle at a time so you can see their relationship and to make everything else sort of fade away. So we're building on that technique. So it sounds like you have to be really strategic about what images you use and how you use them because they might even be confusing if they weren't, if, if there's mm -hmm. no real optic there the students might get just even more There's also a set of supplementary materials that we've begun putting together that we could either present through the game or uh, in a classroom experience separate from the game. The, and this goes to a couple of other questions that were asked about scientific thinking and about um, open source and, and how do people have trust this information. So as much as possible, we're trying to find real data and we're tagging, we're creating Google Docs that say, here is where we got this information from. Here is this scientific paper. Here is this uh, set of uh, microscopy uh, imaging. And, and here was our technique for counting microtubules or something like that uh, to estimate the density. And pointing back to that information, often it's uh, open source or openly available. We got a lot from bio numbers. Uh, so we're pointing people back to these sources but there are limitations to that as well. Sometimes the information is not known, and we have to make an educated guess. So as we're talking to the scientists who discovered the ionosite, and we're like, wow, there's these projections, these little arms, like, tell us more about that. What's in them? What do they do? And the scientists said, we don't know. <laughs> so uh, we had a lot of uh, questions where like, well, it, would it be plausible if it was, uh, ha had some kind of sensing role or some kind of communication role between uh, cells because uh, these are on the basal side, like facing away from the epithelial. Um, and they're like, yeah, well, there are lots of cells down there. It would make sense that maybe it would be a sensing or communication. But that's really just a hypothesis at this point. Mm -hmm. And so we try to communicate in these supplementary materials about like, this is an estimate, this is a, a guess, and we'll revise as knowledge of groups. I, I do wanna, I, I thought about the, the, the Flat Earth game um, for just a couple more minutes. <laughs> and I think there's an interesting thing, um, and 
Dan, maybe you remember that there's a game that the um, Game Lab made about uh, the speed of light. Do you remember what it's called? A slower speed of light. Slower speed of light, um, which is about what would happen if light moved at a slower speed. I guess I should have figured that out. That was the name. Um, and sort of you experience a world where the light is. So you could imagine sort of experiencing what if what if the Earth were flat? You know, what would you? How would you experience phenomenon differently than now? So I think for certain kinds of phenomenon, you can actually sort of say suppose. Suppose this is true. What would you what would you experience? What kind of data would you collect that would sort of help you realize that that was the truth? Um, anyway, sorry. We had that's my next game. <laughs> two, two, two questions. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I when you were comparing the pre and the post test, yep. were you discriminating between uh, explorers and navigators? So and, did, and what differences did you find? Yes, there are definitely differences in the explorer and the navigator. And one thing that uh, one thing that's pretty clear is that the navigator will actually draw the cell, the big shape in uh, in the way that it's represented, whereas the explorer really um, gets just kind of a close up view, and so doesn't have doesn't always get this idea of uh, the shape of the cell. So that's one thing that immediately um, becomes apparent. Um, but in 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 some ways, the, the explorer actually definitely will draw more of the um, the inner kind of structure of the cell, the microtubules, the um, intermediate filaments. They really get the sense of the cell as a structural place, and that's something that happens in VR. So that's uh, two examples. But yes, they do. They are different. We have one more question. Thanks, Marla. This was amazing. Um, kind of a follow-up on that. Did students prefer being the navigator or the explorer? And what were some of the additional benefits outside of learning about the cells for the students? So yeah, so uh, students, we generally let them decide. And then we gave them the opportunity to do um, the other, um, just so they would have it. Um, and so I think that often, many times, this is the first time somebody's ever been in virtual reality. We are still at that point where this could potentially be the first time. And so many times, if the student hadn't had a previous experience, they would say, oh, ooh, I'd like to do it. And the person who had a, a previous experience would be the navigator. Um, the, they, one of the key things that students get from this experience is this idea of they, they get to the end of it, and they're like, gee, colla um, collaboration is really hard. Collaborative problem solving is challenging. And so they're actually able to start thinking about, well, how could we have done this better? And one of our goals with the game, we're not there yet, is to make the game so that you can play it again and that you can um, track how you collaborate and be actually be able to work on it in a, in a very specific context. So often when we learn about collaborative problem solving, it's like, work better together. Um, but here's an actual example where you could potentially um, it's, it's a focused enough activity where you could potentially track how you're collaborating, how you're communicating with each other, um, what kind of evidence you're gathering. And so the, those are things that, um, that, some things that we've seen and some things we'd like to see. Okay, go ahead. I have three, but the first two I think are just uh, uh, easy. Um, you can, you could do this also as a computer game. You said instead of doing a computer game. But you could do this as a computer game with lots and lots of little dopamine experience. That would be trivial to do, right? That's number one. Um, the second is you could also track how people use the game, how the students use it. That would also be trivial, right? Yeah. And then the third one. Um, this is for teaching stuff where, spatial stuff where you're giving the students the spatial structures as a fact. It's not about the students creating a space. And this may not be trivial. And I'm I'm thinking sometimes in, when you learn, you know, I, the way I often learn is I I had to write things down on a piece of paper. I need to have it on a single sheet of paper. But it's 2D, you know, and, and in the past there were these ways of the the, the memory palace where people would imagine spaces where they would go in and they would put things and, and you know the relationship between the things were important. If you could do this, I, I would assume in in virtual reality you could generate new spaces yourself, but this may technically not be trivial. So in terms of drawing things in 3D, there are a number of common Tools. There's uh, CAD programs, uh, Maya, 3ds Max, 
for VR specifically, there are a few from uh, Google and uh, Oculus. There's Tiltbrush, uh, Quill, and Medium. These are tools that allow you to basically paint with uh, a VR touch controller or select an object and place it in space. So, and then in coming from 2D, there are tools specifically targeting cells. There's something called Cell Painter uh, that allows you to construct a cell, but just on a, a flat screen. So one could certainly imagine making a 4VR version of Cell Painter where you can add organelles and different densities and orientations and positions and sizes and shapes. Could, uh, and then you could sort of tailor it to what you think is authentic, and then obviously it would be on either the user or a teacher in a classroom environment to say, make sure that your numbers are authentic, or maybe you want to make it fanciful. Uh, so interpreting what that means. Uh, we have found that it's uh, a very high barrier to entry to figure out what's real. So we're trying to do a lot of that legwork to say, you've never seen a cell like this before. We're going to blow your mind. You're going to come away feeling like, wow, I had no idea cells were so full of stuff, that there was so little space, that uh, shapes were so complex, that things were so near each other. Um, now, with that information as a reference point, it would be much easier for you to choose a different cell, for example, as a classroom assignment to uh, research and build in VR. I think that's one direction that this project or a similar one could go, uh, and it builds on sort of uh, constructionist uh, pedagogies that we all uh, like in the lab. Um, I think there, there's a danger that you could create something and not know if it's real, and you could create something and share it with other learners who also don't know if it's real or, or which parts of it are real. Uh, as I'm explaining what we've built, I even have to add asterisks here and there. I'd say like, well, our smooth ER and our rough ER and our nucleus are amazing. Our microtubules and intermediate filaments have these sort of issues right now, and we hope to improve them. Uh, when you go to nano scale and you look at the uh, rough ER, the outer membrane with the ribosomes and the mRNA going through it and translating and creating these amino acid chains, unfolded proteins, and then you go through a translocon to the inside of the rough ER, and then it's just this great big void. And really, there should be another membrane right away, and there should be all these other proteins that are in that space. So there are limits to the degree that we've been able to create authenticity, even as a semi-professional production team with a grant and multiple years to work on this. So what expectations can we have of a student creating something that even closely approximates this level of veracity, which isn't all the way. So I think there is power in learning in that way, but you also need to contextualize it and is it real and, and how. We've pretty much run out of time, but this was great. Thank you so much.